Okay, let's see what you guys think. Question one, this is from group three. Ender thinks of this blessing as a gift so sacred he himself was not allowed to understand. Um, so, like, I had the chance to talk with group three earlier. Do you want to add to what you told me? Okay, okay. So group three says um, that um, because the word salam is a religious word, um, so it does seem reasonable that Ender would not know exactly what this word means. But the overall situation, uh, he's leaving his friend uh, and he doesn't know what the future will bring. That situation seems to tell a usual person that a lie is blessing him. Like even though he doesn't know the specific meaning of the word, he should know what this action is. So the fact that Ender doesn't understand, he just thinks of it as a gift that he's not supposed to understand, um, tells group three that Ender perhaps uh, lacked the usual amount of socialization that a normal kid would have. Um, he probably has not experienced as many social situations. His social intelligence, let's say, is perhaps a bit lower than the usual kids. Um, and so he doesn't understand what's happening, and so he gives this situation a deeper meaning than a usual person might. Um, and I do think that kind of makes sense. From what we have seen so far, Ender has been isolated throughout his entire life. The only person who really does care about him is Valentine. Uh, and we might also add that there is a kind of separation between the genders as well. So even though um, they are near the same age, gender also isolates Ender from Valentine to a degree. Of course, they're like, what, six and seven? Like little kids is not that different, but there is still some difference. So Ender has been alone throughout most of his life. Uh, it does make sense to think that he has a less extensive understanding of social situations. Uh, and so in this case, he turns the idea of not understanding into something meaningful. Like the fact that he does not understand itself makes the situation even more special. And so he calls this blessing a gift so sacred that even he himself could not be allowed to understand what it meant. Uh, now, another part of this answer for group three is that Salam is a religious blessing, but religion is banned in the story of the novel, in the world of the novel. So Ender does not have that other route of understanding what's going on. Like if in our world, uh, Ender could have maybe read about uh, this word or read about um, the Muslim religion. Um, but in the world of the novel, he ha doesn't have this chance. So either way, through socialization or through like education, he doesn't know what's going on. Uh, and so this is what group three says, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I also want to add that we can think about the nature of a gift. What is a gift? A gift isn't an object, right? A gift is a symbol of a relationship. Uh, it's not the thing itself, it's the meaning behind the thing. Uh, so like in English, we have the phrase, it's the thought that counts. So even though Ender doesn't understand what this word means, he can still see that it is a kind of gift. Um, and so for Ender, he, because he doesn't know what the thing is, he focuses even more on the relationship, on the meaning behind this gift. Uh, and he kind of turns it around so that it is precisely because the meaning is so much more important than the actual thing itself that Ender calls this a sacred gift. Um, it's like in some religions, uh, there are sacred objects. 
And in some cases, those objects are completely useless. You don't, can't do anything with them. They aren't even beautiful. The point of those objects is not the thing itself. It's the religious meaning of those objects. Uh, and so Ender, I think, is following a similar logic when he calls this word he does not understand a gift that is more sacred because he cannot understand it. Uh, and so this tells us that um, the the there are, there are many aspects of human relationships where the point is not what you do or what you give or what you say. The point is the intention or the feeling behind those uh, concrete elements. It is the thought that counts. OK, uh, other groups, do you want to add or ask questions? OK, let's move on. Question two, group two. There are two points in the novel where Ender focuses on beauty. Why? Let me read the two parts to everyone. Well, the first one on page 73. Um, after it says the end of the world. Three paragraphs down. The door closed behind him. Ender studied the scene intently. With the beauty of it, he cared less for survival than usual. He cared little at the moment what the game of this place might be. He had found it, and seeing it was its own reward. And so, with no thought of consequences, he jumped from the ledge. The second uh, place is on page 76. And this is when Ender first meets Bonso. Page 76, third paragraph, suddenly. Though no one said to be quiet, the laughter stopped and the group fell silent. Ender turned to the door. A boy stood there tall and slender with beautiful black eyes and slender lips that hinted at refinement. I would follow such beauty, said something inside Ender. I would see as those eyes see. So group two, what do you make of these two scenes? What's going on here? Why does Ender suddenly notice beauty in these two places, but nowhere else in the story? So as I read that novel and uh, I find that the first time is that the, he, he said beauties just played just played in the, in the game right? and uh, he follow the instructions for the game and he find uh, the gate and after he entering the, the, the gate he find the, he say uh, he overlooking from the, the higher place and say it's a it's a beauty. It's the first. It's the first beauty he says, and I think that, and the second time he's, he's he, the the time he saw, he the, the the captain of his team, right? So I was thinking that maybe, Ander is a guy who he try. He is believing in himself, or he understand himself very much. He just follow his heart, and that is he follow his instinct. Maybe that's something he doesn't know. I just think that if that is beauty and that I would do that or I would try to find what that or maybe he think that beauty to him is is a higher level for himself right so he wants to be or maybe there is some power <laughs> appears to him means the beauty to him because he it seems that beauty is different from the definition of beauty is different from everyone right so what is things beauty? Maybe well, I would say that maybe it's just a, a, a idea out of the box, right? So yeah, I was thinking he just follow follow his instinct and try to stick his his what he believes and stick his rules and try to make it work, right? Yeah, that's how I think. 
OK, thank you. Yes, that is a very interesting answer. It is true. Different people will find different things to be beautiful. And so you're saying that for Ender, he sees beauty, but what it really means to him is something that he wants, something that he wants to pursue. Uh, you said that maybe it is a something. I think you said something like it's a, it's something good, right? It's something higher. Um, and that is a very fascinating way to think about this. If we go back to page 73, as you mentioned, this is the first time that he enters this part of the game and he sees everything is so beautiful. The novel tells us he cared. He doesn't care about his own safety. He doesn't care about what the game wants him to do like the rules of the game. The only thing he wants to do with no thought is to enter this scene. And the straightforward way to do this is to walk off of the ledge. Right, it's in front of you, or sorry, it's in front of him. He wants to be part of it. He wants to pursue it. He wants to chase this beauty. And so he doesn't think about it at all. He just drops. I think that's that makes sense. Same for page 76, right? He sees this uh, new commander and he doesn't know it's a commander. He doesn't know who this person is. He sees a boy, tall and slender, uh, beautiful black eyes, slender lips that hinted at refinement. Refinement here means culture, a good upbringing, a good family background, money. In other words, aristocracy, Sangdeojeji. By the way, this is very different from how Bonso looks in the movie. I'm not quite sure why they decided to change that part. Uh, in the movie, Bonso just looks like a gangster. Uh, but here it says Bonso is, is a beautiful boy. And so Ender's reaction is to, to he doesn't even say this, right? He's, it says something inside Ender says, I would follow such beauty. The word would here means I want to. Uh, I would follow such beauty. I would see as those eyes see. So again, as you said, he's like chasing, he's pursuing this beauty. And in fact, that last sentence, I would see as those eyes see. He seems to be connecting the beautiful person with a beautiful experience of life or a perception of life. Seems to be thinking that a person this beautiful, everything he sees must be beautiful. Um, and so, like, what can we say about these two moments? Uh, I actually gave you a small hint when I said that these are the only two moments in the whole book where Ender notices beauty. Is this because he doesn't notice beauty, or is it because there is no beauty? In the world of this novel, all of humanity is organized to fight a war. They have controlled the population, they have banned religion, they have uh, basically plucked every eligible child and sent them into space to train as soldiers from the age of six. What beauty is there in this world? So when Ender notices beauty, it is like a great exception to his life experience up to this point. No wonder it's so powerful for him. It's not something that he he experiences regularly. Like we in our world, like if we want to see something beautiful, we'll like look at the sunset or something, right? But to Ender, like his whole society is so geared toward this one goal, and it's a violent goal. That beauty is a surprise. It has power for him. So it's so powerful that he doesn't care about his own survival. Uh, so we, from these two moments, we can also notice this part of the world of the story. I want to point out one more thing on page 76. Um, we know that in this story, Ender meets uh, a girl also, right? Petra. We know this from the movie played by Haley Steinfeld. And yet the person that Ender thinks is beautiful is not the girl, it's the boy. Uh, and this is where I have to mention, uh, first of all, I will remind you that the word bugger is an insult for gay men. 
but also that the author, Orson Scott Card, is a devout Mormon who thinks that homosexuality is evil and should be abolished. He's anti-gay. Um, as I'm sure you have noticed throughout life, people who really hate something often secretly are fascinated or interested in that something. Uh, think of how many so-called conservative politicians are actually secretly gay, right? Um, so when the author publicly says that uh, being gay is an evil thing, I think that also leads us to look at his novel through a queer lens, a, a lens of like, is there any gay element in this story? And to me, this is the key like moment. Um, it's not sexual, but it is a kind of attraction. Uh, and Ender doesn't say like, um, I love this man, uh, this boy, or I want to sleep with this boy. He says, I want to be this boy. I want to see through his eyes. Um, and according to like one school of thought, the idea of beauty is not wanting to possess. It is wanting to become. Or like cuteness as a lower form of beauty is also not wanting to have, but wanting to be. So that's something you can think about um, in relation to the author and the story. Let's take a short break.
OK, let's move on to question three. This one is group one. So Ender in his first army, Salamander army, is isolated, abandoned. Fonso doesn't let him do anything. But when he gets to his second army, Rat army, he is included in regular maneuvers, regular actions. Let's take a look at page 106. Uh, the last paragraph before the section break. More battles. This time Ender played a proper role within a tune. He made mistakes. Skirmishes were lost. He dropped from second, uh, sorry, from first to second in the standings, then to fourth. Then he made fewer mistakes and began to feel comfortable within the framework of the tune. And he went back up to third, then second, then first. So group one, do you think that this experience is important for a genius leader like Ender? Why or why not? Right, so group one points out that um, the novel very skillfully tells us that Ender is slowly learning how to be part of a team. The fact that he drops down the rankings and then he goes back up tells us that he doesn't know how to be part of a team until he has the experience. He has to make those mistakes and learn from those mistakes in order to become a good team member. So when we think about this question, it then becomes why is it important for a leader to know how to be a good team member? After all, a leader in the future doesn't have to be part of a team. He has to or he or she has to lead the team. And group one believes that the main important thing is that um, knowing how to be part of a team helps the future leader learn how to communicate with the team. Uh, we can explain this in more detail. Um, we've all heard stories about like bad bosses, right? Or like um, in the legal system, a bad judge, Kong Fa Guan. 
And whenever we hear those stories, we always think the reason that they are bad is because they don't know about real life. They don't know about people's actual situations. So this is what Ender is learning from being a member of the team, people's actual experiences. In the future, when he has to give orders, he will have a better idea of what his team members are going through, what they need, what they are good at, uh, how they can work together and communicate together. If he doesn't have this experience, um, he's a smart guy, so he might make the mistake of thinking that all of his followers are equally smart, which is not true. Um, and if you make that mistake, uh, you may not give enough explanation. You may not give enough clarity. Uh, and it would result in a worse team performance. So the fact that he is able to learn what it means to be part of a team, how a team actually works together, how a team communicates, makes him a better leader in the future, even when he will no longer be part of a team. Does that make sense? Yeah, OK, thank you. Uh, other groups, do you want to add ideas or questions? OK, then let's move on to question four. Group five is not here today, so I gave this question to group three. The question is when Valentine is talking with Peter. Uh, in this scene, Peter is trying to convince Valentine to help him take over the world on the Internet. Uh, and of course, Valentine doesn't want to help Peter. Uh, but in the end, Peter like. Exposes a vulnerable side of himself, starts crying. And so Valentine thinks he's manipulating me, but that doesn't mean he isn't sincere. So group three, do you think this makes sense? Why, why not? So group three says that we know Peter is a bastard. He bullies people, tortures little animals, and yet the adults all like him. So we know that he is manipulative. But at the same time, the things that he's saying to Valentine do sound sincere, and the tears um, are real tears in the sense that he didn't like drop tears into his eyes, right? They really come from his uh, tear ducts. Um, and at this point, we can also think back to the end of chapter one. The last thing we see in chapter one, Ender is lying in bed. And Peter comes up to him and also starts crying and says sorry to Ender. He loves Ender. He doesn't know why he has to hurt people, etc. So of course, that scene might also be manipulation. But in either case, group three agrees with Valentine. It's possible for both things to be true at the same time. Peter could be sincere. And he could be using that sincerity to help 
convince Valentine to change her mind. Manipulation, the word manipulate means to use your hands to do a thing. Many means hands. So you're, the idea of manipulation is you're taking something and you're using it. In this case, the thing that he is using is his own sincerity. His real emotions, his real feelings are being used for his goal. And so he could be both things at the same time. He could be manipulative and sincere. Right, okay, other groups, do you have thoughts or questions about this one? Okay, then let's move on to question five. This one goes to group four. Um, this is a scene where Valentine is talking with Graf. Ender has given up, like basically he's coasting, he's cruising in cruise control. He doesn't try to improve. And so Graf um, wants to motivate Ender to keep improving and learning. So he goes to find Valentine and tries to convince her to write a letter to Ender. Um, and so in the process of trying to convince her, they start talking about what kind of person Ender is, and they start talking about his relationship with Peter. And Valentine mentions that Peter will sometimes torture squirrels to death, um, and that if Ender ever saw one of those dead squirrels, he would be kind to squirrels as a response. Right, and so group four, what do you think this might tell us about Ender as a person? So according to group four, in this situation, we have a kind of a, a triangle. We have Peter. We have the squirrel tortured to death by Peter. And then we have Ender, who Peter also likes to bully. Uh, so according to group four, maybe Ender would be kind to squirrels because to Ender, both he and squirrels are victims of Peter. So like they're in a similar situation. So he would have a he would try to take better care or like share feelings with a fellow victim of Peter. Uh, and on the surface, I think that does make sense, but there's something more that we can say about this scene. So let's go to page 147. Uh, in the middle of the page, the slightly longer paragraph. Peter tortures squirrels. He stakes them out on the ground and skins them alive and sits and watches them until they die. He did that for a while after Ender left. He doesn't do it now, but he did it. If Ender knew that, if Ender saw him, I think that he'd... And then Graf says, he'd what? Rescue the squirrels? Try to heal them? No, in those days, you didn't undo what Peter did. You didn't cross him. But Ender would be kind to squirrels. Do you understand? He'd feed them. But if he fed them, they'd become tame and that much easier for Peter to catch. 
So this is quite interesting. We have two different responses to Peter's actions. Well, three different responses. Graph proposes two solutions. Save squirrels. Or uh, at least not help Peter catch squirrels. Uh, Graph is saying like if you feed squirrels, squirrels would trust humans and it would be easier for Peter to catch a squirrel. So Graph's two uh, responses are all from like rational theory, like how, uh, what would you do directly to help squirrels or at least not hurt squirrels? But according to Valentine, Ender's response would be different. He would be, instead of trying to save the squirrel tortured by Peter, instead of like trying to protect the squirrels, he would simply be kind to squirrels. Now, Graf is right. This does nothing to help the squirrels survive. What it does do is it makes the squirrels life, as long as the squirrel is alive, it makes their life better. It's a, we can think of this as a, a question between quantity and quality. Um, so Graf is thinking about how to help squirrels, how to keep them alive, how to stop them from dying. So he's thinking about the number of squirrels. But Ender, according to Valentine, is thinking about every single squirrel. What kind of life do they have? What kind of experience of life can each squirrel have and how can Ender help in that part? So that's the first big difference, right? Graf is the military man. He wants humanity to survive. But Ender doesn't really. We know that there's a side of him that's not that violent. He only fights when he believes that he has to. He would rather ha uh, help create a life that is not just longer, but also more meaningful. Uh, and the second thing we can say about this situation is that Ender is not thinking about a specific or not thinking about specific squirrels like uh, a squirrel tortured by Peter that he could save or a squirrel that might be tortured by Peter that he could protect. He's thinking about squirrels in general as a species. Uh, and that is a kind of foreshadowing for how he thinks about the war between humans and aliens. We at the end of the novel, we learn that he. Feels immense guilt, not that he killed so many aliens, but that he thinks that he has ended the alien species. And that kind of species thinking is already on display in this scene. By being kinder to other squirrels, He's not helping the squirrels caught by Peter, but he is helping the species of squirrel. OK, so thank you, group four. Other groups, do you have thoughts or ideas about this? OK, um, so before next week, please finish reading up to chapter. 12. I've read this book about seven times, maybe eight times, maybe even more. Uh, and chapters 9 to 11 are my favorite chapters. Um, they're the most exciting, I think. Um, but also like this book has a lot of good writing. Um, when we were talking about question. Three and I read that paragraph about Ender. Um, joining a team and then um, learning and improving. That paragraph is just it, it's incredibly good writing. In English, we think of good writing as two things clear. And concise concise means precise and short. It says exactly what it's trying to say, and it doesn't say anything more. It uses the smallest number of words to convey the most accurate meaning. That's exactly what happens in this paragraph, right? More battles. It doesn't say 
there were more battles later. It doesn't say Ender participated in more battles. It just says more battles. This time Ender played a proper role within a tomb. He made mistakes. What a simple sentence. He made mistakes. It doesn't say like sometimes he got this wrong or sometimes he got that wrong. It's just the general clear idea that he made mistakes just like any other normal human being. Skirmishes were lost. Another very clear sentence. He dropped from first to second in the standings, then to fourth. Notice that it skips third. If the point is to show that Ender is falling behind, you don't need to say every single number. You have to say the first number and the last number. That's all you have to say, right? You dropped one, you dropped three, you ended up on fourth. Then he made fewer mistakes and began to feel comfortable within the framework of the tune, and he went back up to third, then second, then first. When he goes back up, you do have to say the numbers. The idea is that it is harder to improve than it is to get worse. So when you get worse, you fall quickly, but when you improve, you climb slowly. So like even though this is a novel for young adults, some of this writing is just really fantastic writing. OK, let's go back to the start of chapter seven. Salamander. Isn't it nice to know that Ender can do the impossible? So again, it's sarcastic. The players deaths have always been sickening. I've always thought the giant's drink was the most perverted part of the whole mind game. But going for the eye like that, this is the one we want to put in command of our fleet. OK, I think at this point in the novel, we can guess who's talking. The person who thinks that it is terrible to kill the giant by jumping into his eye seems to be Major Anderson. The person who has consistently cared more about the kids. Whereas the other person who says Ender can do the impossible or the next line, what matters is that he won the game that couldn't be won. The person who cares about results, who believes in Ender, this one is probably Graf. Right, so by reading the novel, we slowly get a better sense of the people in this world and how they think. This is quite interesting. We have not I don't think we've actually met Major Anderson, right? Like we only know that Major Anderson exists because of these unnamed dialogues near the beginning. And yet, and yet we already have a sense for what kind of person this is. We already have a sense of this person's role in the battle school, which is as a kind of psychologist for the children. And this is how plays work, right? Like They don't nobody tells you who are these people. You have to figure it out from what they say on stage. Okay, and then Anderson says, I suppose you'll move him now. We were waiting to see how he handled the thing with Bernard. He handled it perfectly. So as soon as he can cope with the situation, you move him to one he can't cope with. Doesn't he get any rest? He'll have a month or two, maybe three with his launch group. That's really quite a long time in a child's life. This is actually a good point. Have you noticed that the older you get, the shorter your days feel? Like when you were a kid you, and you had a free day, like maybe school was canceled or something. So much time, you could do so many things. It felt like the day may, would be endless. Or like if you're stuck in a terrible day, right? Class after class, test after test, and then you have to go to Bushiban. The day would never end. But now it kind of feels like the days are shorter. If you don't like this day, you can like make it through, go to sleep, and tomorrow is a new day. And there's a reason for this. 
it, it's a mathematical reason. The older you get, the proportion of each day to the rest to the all of your previous life is a smaller and smaller proportion. And so the older you get, the faster each day seems to feel because you have so much experience behind you. Um, so um, if anyone ever offers to make you immortal, never say yes. Because by the end, one day will feel like a second or shorter. You will have so much in your experience that you will not be able to understand what's going on in the present. So yes, when Graf says uh, two or three months is a long time in a child's life, it's true. Anderson, does it ever seem to you that these boys aren't children? I look at what they do, the way they talk, and they don't seem like little kids. They're the most brilliant children in the world, each in his own way. But shouldn't they still act like children? They aren't normal. They act like history, Napoleon and Wellington, Caesar and Brutus. Uh, here, Anderson is mentioning two pairs of military enemies. Napoleon, you guys know Napoleon, right? You guys know that Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo, Huatelu. The other army at Waterloo was led by Wellington. So these are enemies. And then the other one, Caesar and Brutus. Brutus is the person. OK, first of all, do you guys know how Caesar died? Caesar didn't die in a war. He was in the Senate giving a speech and a group of men stabbed him. I think it was like 52 times. He was assassinated. Brutus is widely considered to be the leader of that group. So not only are they enemies, uh, like these two examples from Major Anderson, not only are they enemies, they are historical enemies. So important that today we still remember their names. Or at least I still remember their names. Maybe not you. Graf, we're trying to save the world, not heal the wounded heart. You're too compassionate. General Levy has no pity for anyone. All the videos say so, but don't hurt this boy. Are you joking? I mean, don't hurt him more than you have to. So it doesn't feel like Ender is going to catch a break anytime soon. By the way, uh, on the final exam, one of the questions will be related to child abuse. Uh, we're going to read a paper on that in week 17. OK, and then the chapter starts. Eli sat across from Ender at dinner. Uh, so they're facing each other. I finally figured out how you sent that message using Bernard's name. Me? asked Ender. Come on, who else? It sure wasn't Bernard. And Shen isn't too hot on the computer. And I know it wasn't me. Notice this sentence structure. A sentence and a sentence and a sentence. Usually this tells us that the speaker has not planned out the series of sentences. It tells us that a lie is sort of saying whatever he thinks. He doesn't have a clear idea. He just says whatever he thinks of. And that tells us that a lie is a bit more like a child than Ender is. Throughout this whole thing, I don't think we ever see Ender say a single childish sentence. But here, a lie is using a more childish sentence structure. Uh, I know it wasn't me. Who else? Doesn't matter. I figured out how to fake a new student entry. You just created a student named Bernard blank. B-E-R-N-A-R-D space. So the computer didn't kick it out as a repeat of another student. 
Sounds like that might work, said Ender. That's quite interesting. Eli basically told Ender, this is how you did it. It makes sense. Uh, and yet Ender still does not admit that he was the person who did this. Even though he and Eli are now friends. And this tells us that Ender is still a bit distrustful of the people around him. The result of his long isolation from others. Even toward a friend, he is not willing to admit that uh, he actually did this. A lie. OK, OK, it does work, but you did that practically on the first day. Or somebody maybe Dap did it to keep Bernard from getting too much control. I found something else. I can't do it with your name. Oh. Anything with Ender in it gets kicked out. I can't get inside your files at all either. You made your own security system. So that tells us Ender is not just about the attack. He's also about the defense. Maybe. Eli grinned. I just got in and trashed somebody else's files. He's right behind me on cracking the system. I need protection, Ender. I need your system. Ah, so Ender was right not to trust a lie. A lie isn't just chatting. He wants something from Ender. And so notice the strategy that a lie is using. He can't pay Ender. So what he gives Ender is flattery. He makes Ender feel better hopefully so that Ender would be more willing to help out a lie. In English, we call this buttering him up. So make him feel better so that maybe he will want to help you. If I give you my system, you'll know how I do it and you'll get in and trash me. So yes, this is where Ender says the key point that he's trying to defend himself. Next page. You say me, Eli asked. I, the sweetest friend you got. Uh, this is ungrammatical, right? It should be I am the sweetest friend. This is, I think, the first time we see the kind of slang language that these kids have developed at battle school. But we see this a bit later. Uh, we'll see this next week. When Ender leads his own dragon army, he also sometimes talks to his soldiers in slang. Um, this is quite interesting because actually in American English, a lot of slang came from the military. Um, you know, a culture of guys spending every day together, making fun of uh, their superiors, making fun of other groups. It develops their own kind of language. So a lot of English comes from the military. Uh, right, so Ender laughed. I'll set up a system for you. Now? Can I finish eating? You never finish eating. It was true. Ender's tray always had food on it after a meal. Ender looked at the plate and decided he was through. Let's go then. So this tells us that Ender doesn't finish his meals. Could be for two reasons, right? One, because he's a small kid. Two, because staying slightly underfed, staying slightly hungry gives you a bit more energy, gives you a bit more focus. Um, but notice how the novel gives us this information. I think that's very interesting. Through a very normal dialogue, right? Can I finish eating? Um, the novel guides us to that information. So we know that the author planned this, but it feels very natural. When they got to the barracks, Ender squatted down by his bed and said, Get your desk and bring it over here. I'll show you how. But when Eli brought his desk to Ender's bed, Ender was just sitting there, his lockers still closed. This is also very fascinating. Throughout this novel, most of the time we are staying with Ender. 
But at this moment, we leave Ender and we follow a lie. And the reason is because the novel wants to give us that sense of surprise that Ender cannot access his own locker. What up? asked a lie. This is also slang, right? Usually we say what's up. What's up is also slang. What up? asked a lie. In answer, Ender palmed his door, so he put his hand on his door. Unauthorized access attempt, it said. It didn't open. Um, so before we stop, I want to say one more thing. Notice that this happens to Ender just as he is about to teach a lie how to defend himself. We know that Ender doesn't want to teach other people just in case other people will come back and attack him using the same system. But the novel very cleverly prevents Ender from sharing his secret. In English, we call this. Um, there are two ways to talk about this. One way is it someone is saved by the bell. And this comes from high school in American high school. As soon as the bell rings, you can leave the room. It doesn't matter if the teacher is finished or not. So saved by the bell means just before the teacher sent, gives you homework, the bell goes off. So technically you don't have homework. And the other way to talk about this is as a deus ex machina, which is Latin for God from the machine. And this is when in a story, there is no good way to resolve the situation. So instead, the author arranges some kind of coincidence or some kind of special occasion. In Greek tragedy, in Greek tragedy, it was literally a god would descend from the, the top of the stage and like change the entire situation. There's no logic to it at all. It's a coincidence that helps the story move on. In Chinese, we call this jishiesen. Okay, let's stop here. Questions? Okay, so read up to chapter, what was it, 12 before next week.